Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a video and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful people from around the world. Today, it's my privilege to welcome a very, very celebrated army officer who gave up his career in the army and has now taken up to looking after and empowering youth in the northeast of the country, Colonel Chris Regal. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Ashutosh. Great to be here. Colonel Rigo is the founder of the Sunbird Trust, which was set up to empower youth and build friendship between the people of different ethnicities. And he's a colonel from the Corps of Engineers. So, Chris, what would you say are the three key milestones in your life or your career? The very first, I would say, Ashutosh, is, uh, of course, being selected for the Army. I come from a lineage of, you know, four generations in the army, mm -hmm. uh, starting from my great grandfather downwards. Wow. And uh, we even have the pride that somebody from our extended uh, family was a chief of the naval staff. Mm -hmm. So coming from that background, it, it, joining the army, I would say, was a very big uh, milestone. Uh, it changes the direction of your whole life and you spend uh, decades over there. Mm -hmm. So that itself, I would say, was one of the first um, key milestones. Within the army came the second milestone was being posted twice to the Northeast, okay. which completely changed my perspective, you know, and did away with all the prejudices that one comes loaded with when you get mm. posted to that part of the country that the Northeastern people are like this and, you know, uh, their attitudes, their behaviors, while being with them and experiencing their realities, it changes your perspective completely. Okay. And the third, of course, milestone is the launching of Sunbird Trust. Mm -hmm. It is so great to have a way to express all the thoughts and ideas that I gathered along the line and put them in action through Sunbird Trust. Wonderful. So, uh, you know, let's talk about the Sunbird Trust. Yeah. Tell me about the kind of work that you are doing. So my experience in the Northeast has been basically that I personally... Uh, saw the, you know, the turbulence, sometimes even the violence that was there. Mm -hmm. And in such a beautiful part of our country, I felt it was totally unnecessary. Mm. And if you see that over decades, so much has been lost in livelihoods, in the way people live, the peace, the tranquility, and all for no good reason. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought there had to be a better way than keeping the gun pointed at our own people, mm -hmm. you know, and... Um, so many different ways that could be done. And I came to the uh, uh, reality that people were getting into this mode because many of the youth were not getting a chance to be educated. Mm -hmm. There were two th different things. Firstly, it was their inability financially to ex uh, access education. Okay. And physically living on so many hills so far from the nearest school, having to stay in inaffordable hostels. Mm -hmm. So I thought of using peace, building peace through education. And in multiple ways, firstly, by creating that excess, both financially and physically. Mm -hmm. And secondly, getting to the population, local populations through the children, uh, through their education, getting connected with the local communities. Okay. So uh, in a nutshell, the work of Sunbird Trust is peace through education. Peace through education. Yeah. And when you talk education, you're talking of uh, K to 12, is it? Or Generally, K to 12, mm -hmm. we are now started putting up, uh, we have now started uh, taking out our children beyond the 10th to the 12th, beyond the 12th to graduation. And we even have a couple of postgraduate children now. Wonderful. And what motivated you to, uh, you know, set up this trust? I mean, why, why a trust? Why don't you just go and work uh, with some private sector company and do something similar? Well, I would have to say that the temptation was there being an engineer officer with an MBA and three decades in the army Correct. Uh, and with infrastructure going the way it is in the country. There were many, many opportunities to go to the corporate sector, especially Correct. as many of my batchmates had gone that way. But having been in the Northeast, I think for very selfish reasons of really loving the place, loving to be with the people, the communities, mm -hmm. I saw an opportunity to take a different path. Okay. And I'm so glad that I did do that. It was that uh, the way to solve these social problems could be through education, through engaging with people, through opening channels of uh, communication between the local people, not only with the rest of the country, mm. but also with the security forces. Okay. And uh, I think the environment has a lot to do with it. People over time have been confined to their villages. It's been the frog in the well syndrome, which you know they could not 
uh, really be responsible for. Mm. But now with the opening of communications of uh, mass media, there's an opportunity to make these changes. Okay. And, you know, out of all the states of the seven states of the Northeast, which states are you working in right now? The majority of our work is in Manipur, okay. where the situation among all the seven, or let's say rather the eighth sister, the eight sisters being, uh, you know, the eighth sister being Sikkim. Yeah. So the, the majority of our work is in Manipur. Okay. But we have also extended to Nagaland, to Assam, Arunachal, and now even to Meghalaya. Wow. Fantastic. Yeah. And, you know, uh, each of these states, like all the other states of India, are, are very different. What are the challenges you face in, uh, on account of multiple ethnicities in the Northeast? I'm so glad you brought up that question because, for instance, uh, when you're in Bangalore or in Delhi, mm. you will think of a Naga being a Naga and nothing else. Correct. Whereas if you actually go to Nagaland, you'll find that there are 16 major tribes and multiple minor tribes. Correct. Which we don't, don't even know each other's language. Mm. And more than that, they're even physically different in their features. Mm. So that's the diversity in a small state of less than 2 million people. Correct. If you go to Arunachal, the, they have almost 200 different uh, uh, tribes and uh, identities. Hmm. So it's a massive challenge where every 40, 50 kilometers you come uh, across a different tribe who have different aspirations, hmm. different, you know, way of living. So that itself is a major uh, challenge. Wonderful. Uh, there is also the security challenge, which hmm. is quite, um, quite a big one, especially hmm. for our young team members working in very remote areas where there is violence, where there is ambushes on our uh, security forces, and we have set up our schools and hostels. But fortunately, we've been able to overcome that with a lot of trust. And our biggest insurance policy is the women who have told, you know, the, the sons, the brothers, the fathers and the uncles and whatever, that these guys are here to help us educate our kids and you dare not touch them. Okay. So. Okay. And, you know, uh there is a lot of work being done, as you said, on infrastructure, but also at a political and social level. And um, I was in Arunachal two years ago because, you know, we wanted to go just retrace. My father had served in Misamari in 1962. And when I was talking to the people, they said, they said that a huge amount of work has happened in the last five, six years. What, according to you, should be the role of the central government? to be able to bring a lot of these communities into the mainstream of India. I would agree with you that in the past five, six years, there's been considerable outreach from the central government to the northeastern communities, starting with a couple of very high profile ministers from the mm. northeast, especially from Arunachal and from Assam. Mm. So that's a visible outreach. It's not only just the roads and infrastructure, but it's the words and it's the commitment that is being seen Correct. to make a change. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, change doesn't come overnight, but uh, it is visible. It is happening slowly. There is uh, acceptance and um, the will of the government can be seen. So mm -hmm. it is in multiple sectors, whether it be the economy, whether it be in, uh, in travel, uh, opening up ways in which people can come and spend their money and, you know, improve the economy of the Northeast in livelihood, in skilling. Skilling has become a very big thing in the Chinese villages. Now we have uh, skilling. Mm -hmm. So, yes, uh, positive uh, changes happening in the past few years. Hmm. And tell me, Colonel, you know, you may be from Bangalore, I may be from Delhi, someone will be from Bengal. We never ever ask or even think, you know, who's from where. Yes. Yet, for some strange reason, the seven northeastern states and, and Sikkim or the eight sisters get clearly identified in, in India. What can be done or how can the rest of India be educated to be more inclusive? You see, Ashitosh, you and me have never met before, mm. but we still identify on multiple, uh, in Correct. multiple ways. Correct. Uh, for instance, it could be Sachin Tendulkar, it could be Chana Bhutaras, mm. it could be Hindi, Bollywood, Correct. cricket, you name it. Yeah. Uh, most of all by our facial uh, features. But you step across into, say, interior Nagaland or Mizoram, none of these hold through, uh, true. None of these uh, connects are there. Hmm. So uh, starting with the facial features, you're instantly recognizable as somebody different. Hmm. Okay. And there's very little connect, even religion, if you want to uh, mention in many parts, hmm. it'd be food, 
culture certainly language is a big issue mm. and then when you go into still more interior areas where they have never seen a policeman a postman any symbol of india other than perhaps the army or the assam rifle people mm. and we would like to go there and plant a flag and say bharat mata mm. you know they they wouldn't even know what it's uh, all about mm. so that is where the disconnect lies mm -hmm. i would like to say that you know integration and building a a country did not happen at the stroke of the midnight hour 1947 correct it is work in progress hmm. it's not happened in america in 200 years it's going to take time here but it is happening slowly and surely hmm. and are uh, the, the you know are our brothers and sisters in the northeast are they as receptive to uh, integrating with the mainland if i can use that term as i mentioned to you the problem was more about the lack of communication both physical and emotional communications mm -hmm. uh, if you talk of some parts of nagaland there were even head hunters as, as you know as uh, as much as you know 90 or 80 years ago mm -hmm. where people were confined to their villages and didn't have any connect with the outside mm -hmm. uh, world mm -hmm. their whole existence and their nation state was their little village mm -hmm. they couldn't imagine being controlled by somebody from even another tribe mm -hmm. in the same state forget about from somewhere else in india correct so these changes are taking time mm. but what has certainly happened is that there's a flood of youth now going to different parts of the country for work for education and they are bringing back tolerance for diversity for plurality so uh, that is making a change okay. so yes i would say there is definitely an acceptance for instance there's more liking of bollywood music there is more you know speaking of hindi mm. uh, it's a slow process but it is happening it is happening wonderful and you know you had mentioned that you know you are on in, in areas where there are other countries our neighbors are, are are bordering these states whether it's china whether it's myanmar or i think bangladesh as well what kind of influence is wielded by our neighbors on uh, these uh, regions and the people there few people would know that 99% of the northeast has an international boundary Yeah. there's only a small connect through the siliguri correct. corridor correct right so the rest of it is all with uh, foreign countries so but naturally there would be a foreign influence but that too i think is greatly exaggerated let me start with the china hmm. the common perception you know in other parts of india is that okay northeastern people they eat noodles hmm. or they do kung fu and things like that you know hmm. Uh, nothing would be farther from the, the truth correct in mizoram or in nagaland they've perhaps never heard of noodles especially in their villages it, mm. it may be true in the villages of arunachal pradesh where they have the tibetan uh, culture mm. so the chinese influence i would say is quite restricted in other parts excepting maybe in arunachal or maybe some parts of sikkim where it's mm. more the tibetan rather than the chinese influence mm. but in other places yes there is the influence of drugs we are close to the golden triangle Mm -hmm. so there is smuggling of drugs and consequently a big effect hiv aids and those type of things okay. a lot of uh, smuggling and of course there's a little bit of the infiltration from bangladesh which i hope will stop soon because bangladesh is improving considerably as a nation in terms yeah. of their economy and whatever okay and uh, you know what is the impact of china i mean you know a very highly developed country on some of the states there so the chinese influence uh, i would say is very limited because culturally it is um, i would say almost negligible if you want to talk of mizoram manipur uh, nagaland perhaps slightly in the northern areas of arunachal maybe in some areas of uh, sikkim again more of the tibetan influence okay with the recent uh, changes in the security environment uh, with china there could be some changes in terms of them interfering uh, supporting the militants whether in third the third countries like myanmar uh, there's a possibility for them interfering okay. as no as of now i would say that their uh, influence is limited there is a certain amount of um, interference and support for the militant groups mm -hmm. which we'll have to combat and contend with right otherwise not more okay. i'd like to say one more thing about uh, you know culture pop culture that is there especially mm -hmm. in nagaland and mizoram uh, it is more towards korean Uh, pop culture or japanese pop culture right. even winning away from western pop culture hmm. very That's interesting it. so my next question on you know related to the same region and all the work that you are doing there you know uh, chris this is the age of the millennials and millennials in thinking are probably the same all over the world 
you know, they, 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 that's the, the generation that's going to really take our world forward. What is your impression? And you work with children from K to 12. And what is your impression of the millennials? And what are they, what is their thinking of uh, work, coming and working in the other states of India? So this perhaps is the first generation that has got contact with social media, with mass communication. Their parents never had that. Yes. They didn't even have electricity hmm. to have that connection. And now suddenly being exposed to so much, hmm. and you could, you, you, as you would understand, the change is happening very, very uh, rapidly. Hmm. It is certainly having both a positive and a negative uh, impact. Okay. I'd like to be uh, you know, straight with that. Hmm. So being in the school, we find that many of our kids get impacted by the mobile phones and the games and that affects their learning uh, outcomes. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we're able to leverage this in the remote areas and send them their, you know, learning through the uh, these uh, devices. The second aspect would be that they're getting a not, lot of knowledge. You know, uh, it's a window to the world uh, from what they've never seen and heard before. Correct. So uh, they're able to now form opinions of various things, whether polit political, social, and cultural. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, they're able to leverage these platforms, whether it be YouTube or, face or Facebook, for a bit of activism mm -hmm. to stress their views. They are no longer willing to stay quiet, you know, about uh, maybe the way that their parents were. They want this level of uh, activism. Wonderful. Uh, again, on the, on the negative side of things, it has created a bit of materialism. Mm -hmm. You know, this that you see, which causes a bit of pressure on the parents to give them all these devices and give them all these things that they would like. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are some of the uh, uh, aspects. But uh, definitely it is helping them in a big way integrate with the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. They are able to source news uh, and events that are happening everywhere else. They are able to connect with the rest of the country. That's mm -hmm. a very important thing. Wonderful. So, Abhi, I've got two more questions for you on relating to Sunbird and uh, you before I move to some personal questions. An army officer going and working in the Northeast uh, and working with children and making a difference. What are some of the core values you believe in for Sunbird? First and foremost, it is uh, this thing of diversity that uh, uh, you have to come in to accept the reality and the nuances of people where they are mm -hmm. and not tell them what they are supposed to be. Okay. We have to sort of bring them in their own culture, in their own reality, their own aspirations, respect mm -hmm. that tremendously. It calls for some unlearning and learning again and some training also, especially for our team members who come from other parts of the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the country. Uh, another thing is a lot of flexibility for a Sunbird team members because what is the biggest certainty is uncertainty okay. with us. Uh, you never know when there's going to be violence, whether there's going to be some disruption or the other, uh, even the weather in some of our places. Mm -hmm. Our team members are cut off for weeks together from communications. We sometimes have to climb two hills and sit on a, under a particular tree to get a, 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 a signal. Mm -hmm. So that flexibility is another uh, key value that a team member would require. Okay. Commitment is the third. Mm -hmm. With all the challenges that one faces, whether it be the food, the, the culture, the, the lack of uh, communication, commitment to the local people mm -hmm. and to the, the education, to bringing it up, to making those changes not very easy, especially when certain methods are so entrenched. Mm -hmm. That's another thing which is very, very uh, uh, you know, difficult. So these are some of the core values. I wouldn't go with the normal ones of integrity and all, which are definitely there if, in every part of uh, uh, a Sunbird Trust. Fantastic. And my last question to you is that, you know, as an army officer, your leadership style in the army was very hierarchical. How did you have to change your leadership style when you came and started working with, in a more democratic, if that's the right word, environment like Sunbird Trust and students? Yes. So um, I definitely have to make a lot of uh, changes. And mm -hmm. in, um, in the army, the hierarchical way is um, it's an occupational hazard. You have to right. do, you have to follow that. Otherwise, right. uh, you couldn't run your organization well. True. But when you step into the development sector mm -hmm. and, and you have a, a team of young professionals all in the age group of, you know, you could say 21 to 34, 35 years old, you have to change uh, drastically. You cannot bring in that type of hierarchical way of functioning. Right. So I'm happy to say that... Um, I've shifted to a very consensual, 
to uh, a coaching method also if you like to say coaching the uh, with them a shared leadership where we get a lot of ideas we discuss before we take any uh, decisions mm-hmm. so those are some of the things that have uh, more of a team based approach than hierarchical uh, uh, approach okay. and it's worked uh, very well because um, given our dispersion in so many different areas uh, me dictating from a different place to mm-hmm. a person who's been there and who's living there in a particular village may not be the right way to go okay so a lot of respect for my young team members and a lot of learning from them fantastic so time i've got time for a few more questions for you personally yeah. you know yeah. great career in the army uh, successful trust sunbur trust working well with lots of uh, you know children and uh, older people what does success mean to chris it took me some time to figure that out what it really means is you know each one of us has a grain and you cannot explain where that grain comes from mm-hmm. there's a guy who's very fond of of poetry mm-hmm. and you never know it it seems odd to some of us there's somebody else who's got a mechanical bent of mind who likes to you know unravel to uh, fiddle with a car or a scooter or things like that so everybody has this different grain and finding that grain and finding something that aligns which is your life and your work mm-hmm. is not often the easiest thing it, okay. it sometimes takes decades so when you find that alignment of your grain the things that you want to do your hobbies your interests and your work mm-hmm. i think that brings you to a uh, success okay so i would say that if you go by maslow's uh, theory mm-hmm. of self actualization that it is exactly that it's a bit uh, it's a bit archaic when i'm telling you that but that's really what it is when you can reach that stage at the top where you can mm-hmm. actualize all your desires what your inner being it and bring it to bear mm. importantly i would uh, like to stress many people would like to uh, say that success is uh, only based on them i would say that when you see that you are having an impact on the lives and destinies of others mm-hmm. in a very positive way i would also count that as success wonderful and i have time for one more question and that's a follow on question to success yeah. where do you get your inspiration to keep doing such amazing things Thank you uh, Ashutosh I think uh, the first inspiration comes from my parents my father himself was an air force officer who spent 15 years of his life post his retirement in the development sector mm-hmm. and uh, the whole family has had that inclination to be in the, you know working on such things also a very supportive spouse who's taken a lot of nonsense from me in you know the work and a lot of difficulties mm-hmm. uh, that she's had to face a great amount of inspiration from there a lot of inspiration from my young team members who have come at a risk to their lives mm-hmm. to serve in these some of these very very remote uh, areas mm-hmm. and giving of their best so there's a lot of learning and a lot of inspiration from their courage from their commitment that is the third uh, inspiration that i get fantastic on an, on a different plane altogether from the work that i do a person that has influenced me a lot is nelson mandela okay a person who was who spent i think 26 or 27 years in jail who was tortured and everything and yet was able to bring whites and blacks bring the whole country together yeah so for the type of work that we are trying to do or bring bringing peace and friendship between communities mm. he was a big inspiration absolutely no he was an amazing man i i actually had the option to serve with him on on a board in geneva and i met him uh, but that's for another story sometime so but uh, uh, kanu rigo thank you so much it's been such a pleasure talking to you thank you for all the incredible work you're doing for at sunbird and you know making sure that you are able to build such amazing relationships uh, with so many people good luck to you thank you so much ashitosh thank you thank you for listening to the brand called you video cast and podcast platform that brings you knowledge experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals you can also follow us on youtube facebook instagram and twitter just search for the brand called you